In today's show, we're going to talk to a very experienced leader here in Japan who has grown the revenues of that company from 150 million to, well, a cat's whisker of a billion. And talk about some of the issues of leading in Japan. Our guest today will be Mr. Yasu Aki Mori who ran Infineon here in Japan for 17 years, a man with broad and deep experience. So listen in to learn about leading in Japan from a real practitioner, an expert, a man who's got the numbers and runs on the board. Maishu, arigazaimasu, and welcome back to the Leadership Japan series. I'm your host in Tokyo, Dr. Greg Story, your corporate coaching and training guy, the president of Dalkani Training Japan, and the best-selling author for Japan Sales Mastery. And we have a new book on how to master business in Japan called Japan Business Mastery. You can get that on Amazon. We are broadcasting around the world from Minato-ku in the very center of Tokyo, the leadership capital of Japan. Now, this podcast brings insights, examples, and experience about leading in Japan. And trust me, as you will soon hear in my interview with Mr. Mori, it is different here. If you have feedback on the show or preferences about potential future topics, then leave us your comments. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. You might also enjoy the Presentation Japan series and the Sales Japan series wherever you get your podcast. The Cutting Edge Japan Business Show is also available now as a podcast as well. Now, this podcast on leadership released every week, Wednesday, midnight, Tokyo time. If you'd like to join a free live workshop where we can deal with any questions you have, then just put in the email header, I am based in wherever you live and am interested in joining your live leadership session. Send it to me, greg.story at dalecunningy.com. That's G-R-E-G dot S-T-O-R-Y at dalecunningy, D-A-L-E-C-A-R-N-E-G-I-E dot com. I am planning to do a Zoom meeting with everyone, or we'll record it for those who can't make it. Tell me your location, because I may do a couple of versions to best suit your time zone. We are planning this for September the 28th, so shoot me your information so we can organize everything in time. Contact me again at greg.story at dalecunningy.com. So, before we get going, today's handy Japanese phrase is you might be out shopping with a friend and they see a really nice item, but it's a bit on the expensive side and you want to encourage them to buy it. So you say, hey, don't be so tight. Come on. Don't be so tight with the money. Enjoy yourself. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Hey, don't be so stingy. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Ah, don't be such a tight one. Don't be so stingy. Come on, buy it. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. Ketchi ketchi shinai de. This is episode number 325. 3, 2, 5. And today we are talking with Mr. Yasu Aki Mori. Recently retired as president of Infineon here in Japan, and he's a long career leading in Japan, 17 years with Infineon. Took the company from 150 million to, as I say, just shy of a billion. They're over a billion now. So a man with great, great depth of experience and, you know, juggling that geishke, that foreign multinational imperatives with the local market, with the local staff, the local clients. Very, very tricky balance to get that right. Now, he's a man who's done that. He knows what he's talking about. So let's get into the show and hear from Mr. Mori about leading in Japan. So welcome to the Leadership Japan series podcast. We have Yasu Aki Mori, an old friend of mine who's got a long experience in leading in Japan as our guest today talking about leadership. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Uh, interesting. I've never done a podcast before, so I'm very, very nervous. Oh, well, it's simple. You just talk into one of these mics here and it all sort of magically, it all sort of works. So if we think about, you know, leadership has challenges anywhere 
And of course, there's going to be challenges in Japan. Uh, but before we get into that, talk a little bit about your background, the things that you've done, companies that you've led here or outside of Japan. Give our, you know, our audience a little bit of an idea of your background. Uh, well, you know, I guess uh, maybe I'm really, uh, how you describe me? I, I guess I'm Japanese, but not really, or I'm a gaijin, but not really. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite sure where to start off with. Um, anyway, start off with my background. I was born in Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad was doing uh, uh, selling, helping sell Japanese products uh, through Jetro in Canada, probably motorcycles, I think. So I started off with that, and then uh, it was there for five years. And then the dad decided, I don't want to live in Japan, I want to live in somewhere else. Found a job in Geneva in the United Nations and uh, took over the family to, uh, to Geneva. Uh, without knowing the uh, vaccination requirements and all the other stuff that, that happened. So he landed over here. We're, I think we were quarantined for a little bit, maybe. But anyway, started off interesting. And so I spent uh, 20 years there uh, altogether. My dad uh, was there 36 years. So I went to high school there, then to college in the U.S., and then uh, started my career. So I started off in the, in the United States in Silicon Valley, uh, and then moved back every three years, kind of got bored, uh, and then they, they, the company moved me around from between the U.S., Europe, U.S., mm -hmm. and then suddenly uh, the chairman of the company says, you're Japanese, right? And goes, yeah, and then before I could say, yeah, but I was sitting in Japan on a, on a, uh, on a uh, uh, three-year three expat contract, uh, and then uh, suddenly, uh, 20 few years later, I'm still here. So, but who was that with that, that 20 years with which company? Were you with? It was a company, I actually, uh, I'm in the semiconductor industry mm -hmm. and, um, and usually semiconductor industry is known for people turning around every, every two, three years, but I only been with two companies. One was uh, AMD, mm -hmm. a, uh, an American company, a chip company. And the other one is Infineon Technologies, a German based mm -hmm. spinoff from Siemens. Mm -hmm. And so in the first uh, 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 part of career, I, I spent a lot of time between the U.S., Japan, U.S., Europe, and then uh, in, with Infineon, uh, focusing on Japan, but uh, being a global company, I spent a lot of time in the U.S. as well as Europe, et cetera. So you came here to run AMD in Japan? Yes. All right. And how many years did you do that? I was there for three years. Uh, I came around AMD Japan. Well, I was the number two at AMD Japan. And uh, so basically, uh, I guess, uh, bring in a more, uh, a different kind of sales uh, was, was the objective, uh, rather than taking the customer's always right to, hey, the customer's business model is changing, or we try to help change a business customer's model, uh, customer model for the business uh, that they're in. And, um, and then, you know, went from there, and then uh, I was recruited to, to head, take over Infineon, which is a larger company. That was Infineon in Japan. In Japan. Great. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And how long were you with Infineon? I was there for 17, 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, in a, so in a, my previous job uh, in role a, at AMD, I was you know, hopping continents every three, four years. Mm -hmm. Here at uh, Infineon, I stayed on the same job for about 17 years, which mm -hmm. was a long one. So I, I, But, you know, of course, focusing on developing the business and the organization. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges was that when I joined was it was a 50-50 a joint venture between a Japanese company called Fuji Electric and Siemens. Infineon was being spun out from Siemens, so they had to recuperate the 50-50, make it 100% Siemens, and then make Infineon. But uh, what, what was the issue was there was the employees were seconded from Fuji Electric mm -hmm. and the managers were seconded from Germany. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine the interesting situation where I was parachuted in to, uh, to drive the changes there. And, and must have had many challenges in just, I mean, the sheer fact of a joint venture, the sheer fact of local Japanese staff, German executives, you're in the middle, supposedly trying to understand both sides, I guess. So what were some of the things that came up in that situation? Well, I mean, it's clearly uh, a joint venture, sales ventures are tough anyway because they're set up because you're in the same market 
and you think they're synergies, and you know, in fact, you're, you're okay, occasionally you're in a competitive situation. So that was a situation, but also the culture difference is is, is in, in, immense. Huh? So I think for the the German expatriates who were there, was it was great because they had the relationship with Germany. The the, the company was a joint venture, was bringing the technology, and the Japanese staff was providing providing the input to the Japanese customers. But the problem is, uh, the, those, you, despite the German you know German expat Germany communication channel, the Japanese employee customer channel, both were good. The the intermixing between the German expatriate and the Japanese staff had to happen in order to communication because the only communication only happens when the headquarter and the customer link together. And clearly in this case, it wasn't going as smoothly as it should have. Mm. Mm. And obviously you're trying to smooth out that communication. So what things were you doing to try and make that work? Well, first of all, I kind of first of all landed. Uh, the contract was signed by headquarters, so I kind of landed as, "Hi, I'm a new your new boss," and uh, that was uh, caused some little sparks both for the Japanese staff and uh, and, and the headquarters, uh, the the expatriate staff, the delegate staff. So, uh, one recommendation is I probably uh, have a better introduction <laughs> to the to the situation so I think getting trust is the worst most um, toughest situation because without trust you can shout as many orders as you want but each way have a way to um, not follow through on and then they need to understand and and so trust ex- ex- exercise in different manners from Germany and, and, and Japanese uh, and so that was an interesting thing. And what was different? I mean, if you talk about building trust with the German executives and building trust with the Japanese team, what was different? I guess it's, this is more maybe uh, you know, t- stereotyping, which is maybe not good per se, but it, it helps explain the overall picture. I guess in, in Germany, uh, one says one, one thinks. I think that's that's the cultural norms as uh, well, in, in Japan, there's honne and tatemai. Mm-hmm. And so, tatemai, the facing truth, and honne, the real truth. Well, yeah, what do you think versus what you say, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think uh, Germany is supposed to be the same. And in Japanese, clearly, it's okay to say both because everybody knows in Japan is that you need to keep the the wa, the, mm-hmm. the right. relationship harmony, uh, while in Germany, I think harmony is exercised through sa- saying what your opinion is. Yeah. So very clearly, very different sets of uh, expectations, and, um, and getting used to that was tough, not only for the staff, but for the customers as well. Mm. Oh, okay, so talk a little bit about the customer interaction. How was their... How is their reaction to you? You know, you've turned up here and, uh, you know, new guy. And what's the, how was that reaction? So, you know, I tried very hard to become very Japanese because I was very, very conscious that um, and not being Japanese and, and having studied Japan from the outside, you need to fit in. So I was uh, spending an awful amount of time to become very Japanese. And to cut a st- quick story short, everybody says, don't do that. Mm-hmm. And, but that... But the problem is people didn't have the guts to say say that until <laughs> when I became really Japanese and I become a, a Japanese person, right? And so the reason is 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 um, I, th- I think a lot of people know that if you have an advantage, saying you can identify as, as your as a foreigner, and I guess you'd realize that you know as being a foreigner, you get a certain li- passage or leeway, a gaijin pass, mm-hmm. um, which is good. Uh, my mom believed that you can't take the gaijin pass too f- much because at the end you are dealing with a Japanese-based uh, organization which essentially trusts only Japanese at the at the end or, or Japanese mannerisms or traditions, right? So how to balance that was clearly difficult. Except I would say, though, that compared to 20 years ago, there has been a shift in attitude towards, uh, you know, deep inside they still may be uh, very truly traditional, but I think deep inside, uh, externally, the communication has been f- more facility considerably more than than before. So let's talk a little bit about engagement. In my experience, uh, in Geishke Global Companies, when you get to the engagement surveys, you know, to the global engagement survey, and then you get the results and you have a, the, the meeting in the, uh, you know, it's usually Singapore or Hong Kong, the sort of a, APAC hub, and they put up all the results, and APAC's the worst around the whole world. 
And then within APAC, Japan's got the lowest scores <laughs> of everyone. And there's all this pressure to get the uh, scores higher. So how have you found uh, things that work to get the engagement higher levels in Japan? I mean, first of all, it's trust. You know, and I think that's a common thing. But, uh, but then once you get the fundamental trust, how do you change the, the situation where uh, you, you listen versus you actually participate? And uh, I would say once, once you learn a certain level of trust, then I guess you try to engage in a cultural change, right? I think you can't do both at the same time. And so in, in our situation, uh, it was essentially, you know, we, had, we would have all-hands meetings or general smaller meetings where, um, you know, the leadership is the only one talking. But w- one interesting anecdote I would say that, that really happened was um, uh, there was the, 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 the tragic, tragic uh, earthquake and, uh, and tsunami and, and, and earthquake in, uh, in uh, uh, the northern part of uh, Japan several years ago, and and of course we we as as a, being in Tokyo were affected by it, and our employees were affected by it, and so in order to keep uh, operations moving, we had to basically start a, a a daily emergency call meeting, call in or actual meeting, uh, and and to discuss what the issues are and. And we, you know, we always even did some evacuation to to the south and keep keep everybody in, in involved because not everybody could move. But so we kept on doing that, and as things calmed down, we ramped it down to um, twice a week, to once a week, to then to once a month, and then we said, let's 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 stop it. To which the employee says, no, let's continue it, and it, it, it lasted a year, and and basically. The, basically, they they felt that it was they had a need because of the 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 um, the the tragedy we had the earthquake and and, and the, the the difficulties that people had uh, thereafter. But in during those sessions, people start talking about other things and business things, and it became a a place where people would you know we kept it we kept the tradition, changed the time to do it in the middle of the day, and 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 it was attended by eighty percent of the people, which was pretty big, pretty good. And then people start actually commenting and wanted to explain their their situation or their strategy, or and it became a not just a, a all hands for me, but a, more of a town hall where people who had issues or things they wanted to discuss. So that, I think that was a a very good step. So that sort of came about by chance in a way, didn't it? Because. Yes. Uh, the earthquake, obviously, it was very psychologically stressful, physically stressful for a lot of people. And certainly, it, we were having aftershocks, large, large earthquakes, mm-hmm. called aftershocks, but they're, they're a major earthquake in their own right, six, seven times a day yes. for like months. So it wasn't like the earthquake finished and that was it. Mm-hmm. It was still ongoing for those of us who stayed. And so I can understand there'd be some you know need for... Yeah, I'm still not through that. But it's interesting how it morphed into more of a communication thing. What was the sort of communication pattern like for them before that? Uh, you know, it was one way um, and more focused. And if you really want to get communication, so I spent a lot of time drinking, communication, right? And okay. and uh, since I was, when I when I joined, I was uh, in my late 30s and that was kind of rare to have a, uh, Shacho at that age, and so the it was interesting how the younger people invited me out on their on their dough to go out drinking with them rather than a company money, and so and so that was a, that was an interesting thing. So which means that the young people actually wanted to communicate, right? And so they communicate in a different manner. So I think every company has its own culture of communication or its blockages in communication, but you need to find, once you find that, you can start infiltrating and, and kind of building trust at that level, which, and you know, the young people talk to each other all the time. So the communication, the unofficial communication in Japanese companies is superb, I think. So if you can tap into that, make it a more corporate thing and, and kind of shake off this, you know, you know, this communication channel as a silo buster, that could also become uh, very helpful.
So today's show is brought to you by our public courses. And you may be interested to know that we not only do public courses, we also do customised in-house programs for you as well. And we do these, obviously, in Japanese and English. Now, the public programs that I'm going to refer to, one is a one-day program called Step Up to Leadership. And we've just run one. So the next one will come up 27th of January, 2020, right? 27th of January, 2020. Get that in your diary. That's a one-day program. It helps people go from being a player to be a player manager or a manager. And what's different, you know, what's your role now? Uh, how do you become a better communicator as a leader? How do you coach people as a leader? How do you deal with performance as a leader? These are the sorts of things which you have to make that bridge from being one of the troops to being the chief, being the leader. And this is a nice one-day program to help people make that bridge. So 27th of January, next one will roll around. That's next year. This year, this is a more in-depth program, Leadership Training for Managers. This will be on the uh, starting, it's a seven-week program, starting on the 5th of November. 5th of November starts, it runs through to the 17th of December. This is an amazing program. Swiss Army knife, I call it, of leadership because it's got the works. All the things you need to do, and it's got all the structures you need too because Instead of trying to work it out yourself or make it up as you go along or doing it by trial and error, this gives you, you know, the basics of what you need to be a very high-level leader. Now, it's not prescriptive, though. It doesn't say, oh, you know, do this, do that. It gives you structures, and then everyone has their own businesses. They have their own industries. They have their own companies. They have their own set of, you know, the market, the clients. Everything's different. Even in the same company, two people leading the similar sections, you know, sales group, you know, number one and sales group number two or something, they'll have quite different problems because of their, their client base will be different. So you can't be prescriptive around leadership. That's the beauty of this. It's open-ended enough to allow you to customize the content for your reality, but it gives you lots of structure. So you're not running around trying to work it out by yourself. Excellent program. That's coming up on the starting, seven weeks, starting on the 5th of November. Now, our website is full of useful resources. You can go to enjapan.dalecunny.com. Don't forget, you can email me at greg.story at dalecunny.com. Now, watch the Cutting Edge Japan Biz Show on YouTube and listen to it on the podcast if you prefer to do it that way. Also, over at YouTube, we have over 800 training videos there at Japan Dale Carnegie TV. Get my book, Japan Sales Mastery. That is the Bible for selling in Japan. And my new book on how to master business in Japan called Japan Business Mastery. continuing something that had been going on with the previous president where they'd invite them to come out and have drinks or this is new for you? Mm. And why do you think they did that? I mean, that's quite, in a way, they're really stepping out and taking a bit of a risk in a way, aren't they? What, uh, what do you think was driving that? Uh, because I, I guess imagine that they, they, they heard of my reputation of being a, as a kind of a more international, laid-back guy, I guess. <laughs> but but uh, I think what what showed up at the end was, uh, and we identified this later in some of the exercise we have, is it, the middle management tends to be kind of squeezed. And the middle management, the kacho area or the, you know, kakaricho or section heads mm-hmm. uh, are, in f- turned out in our cases, be a large blockage point. Not the fact because they wanted to block, but I think some of them felt that there was a disconnect between the staff and the management. And this is where I, I would say that when we, we, we start off in, you know, to typical to managers that we had you know, two, three year plans and every time we kick it off, explain it. The more, we did about four or five of them. And I think the, the later it got, it got more successful. Uh, no, I think they were all very important, but the engagement became successful later because we identified that I think the middle management was kind of stuck. Yeah, and not stuck particularly because of their fault. I would say there was probably uh, our uh, the senior management issue that 
that maybe didn't pay enough attention to that communication. Because at the senior staff meetings, we were all gung ho. This is a great strategy. Hey, we're going to win this marketplace. And then, you know, when we started realizing that that the echo back didn't happen from the staff when we had this thing, there's a blockade somewhere. And we start looking into that, and we kind of find that that clearly the middle management level were in a, kind of in a in a rut, uh, trying to help. Kind of in, uh, how, how they were not probably not uh, coach enough how to spread the message to their staff when they got it from the senior staff, right? At least in our case, and so we addressed that through uh, training, more training as well as more engagement. And then I think what topped it off is once you get to a certain level, then you what you you can decide that the direction for the next five years at a top. But you need to also in, in, in engage with the staff level. I mean, it sounds obvious, but it's less obvious than do it. And then because what it means from the top staff and what it means to the daily job of the staff level is totally different. So given a very clear example, the finance people thought that it was the job of the finance accounting guys to stop making the sales guys sell, you know, spend too much money uh, and entertainment. So there was a you know serious battle going on. Says this is too much for lunch. Or, this is too much for dinner. And what happened at the end is, kind of uh, long story short, was when they got together and after you know the top manager said we want to go here. What they had to do is because oh, the sales guys are not there to spend money because they want they have family as well. They want to get the best quickly results and then even that saying they got to go out dinner with the customers they're spending time away from, so we need to help them and make this remove these barriers and then they start developing a approval system which is much quicker than than the previous one and the previous one was blocking because of me because I had to always I was always the one in the office to stamp the hanko oh, okay. so they took me out of the loop and this was uh, actually came from the finance group which I thought was extraordinary so the finance group said, okay, uh, this bureaucratic system of getting your hanko chop seal on the uh, official approval process is slowing the whole thing down. Let's just take you out of it yeah. and we'll take over that yeah. accountability, which is, yeah, that's quite that's cool. innovative, isn't it? And, 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 and then that is, they're not the police, the expense police there, but they're more to help enable uh, the salesman get more face time with the customer, I think. That was cool, I thought. Yeah. So the finance group said, okay, uh, this bureaucratic system of getting your hanko chop seal on the uh, official approval process is slowing the whole thing down. Let's just take you out of it yeah. and we'll take over that accountability, which is, yeah, that's quite that's innovative. Cool. And it's interesting how you talk about the uh, middle management being the blocker. They often, they suck up all the information coming from above, but they tend not to be very parsimonious about sending it down the line. And often the why of what's going on is not, transmitted, as you say, the communication issues, the why is understood at the top level, but not necessarily grasped at the bottom level. Yes. And I think uh, it's, 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 it's essentially, you know, the top issue because they haven't explained enough. Because, you know, we always uh, say that, you know, we need to be careful on how, where the information goes. So they, I think there's a belief that, you know, we shouldn't push all the information out because there's a feel of spillage. But unless you tell people what we're doing this for in, in understandable terms, it's never, you know, it's not going to be effective. So I think um, the key thing is push as much information as possible out unless it's strictly confidential and don't mention it, right? So and that culture, it's, it's a cultural thing of, of how you treat information and what you how you hold yourself responsible, right? And I think one of the issues we had... Uh, as a company, we had too many rules. Oh, okay. And, and at one point, there were like so many corporate rules. Even the senior manager didn't know, had no idea what the corporate rules were. And so there was an effort, even from headquarters, to reduce the number of corporate rules and basically have lighthouse ideas, saying, you know, you're supposed to help your colleague. You know, direct you know, general direction where you're going. Have your compass and make your own. You know, make sure that you don't jump off the cliff. You know, simple rules like that, and then let the team 
act on itself, right? I, I mean, it takes time to get from a very bureaucratic state to that level, but mm-hmm. certainly once you get to that, it's possible. And it's even possible in Japan. Japan's interesting to me in the sense of getting innovation. Now, people think that uh, traditionally Japan was a country skilled at copying, and yes, for a long time they were doing that, but they also became very innovative in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Although today we often hear that companies are hoping for greater innovation from the teams, but they complain that the team members themselves are very reluctant to step out of their comfort zone because they worry about making a mistake. Japan is, in my view anyway, a no-mistake culture. So innovation by its nature is messy and there's bound to be mistakes. So how did you find balancing this sort of fear of making a mistake, therefore stay nicely comfortable in your comfort zone with trying to get innovation in the business? Good question. Next question, please. (laughs) Now, um... It's, it's a very, very good point, but I think um, it co- fundamentally comes down to um, uh, corporate governance, I would believe. Um, and why do I say corporate governance? Maybe it's kind of too macro, but I think it has a, is a certain element to truth because um, and corporate governance in the Western societies means that you know it's shareholder value that need to be increasing, and and maybe it's too, going too much to the end, but there's too little that. A lot of people say in, in, in Japan. W- what does that mean? Is you're seeing a lot of uh, issues in corporate, you know, and the, you see, you know, presidents being, uh, sh- you know, fired. Not 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 fired in an American sense, but being removed because of, well, illicit or uh, non-traditional accounting methodologies. Well, I think one of the issues is people's relationship with employment in Japan is somewhat different from the West. And where I think in the West, you're you even 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 in in Germany, where your 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 job is protected, you need to bring value, and 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 you're promoted once you you prom- you can show establish that you bring value to your particular set of circumstances. I mean, by values, it could be monetary, it could be technical. That you actually. Um, increasing your output in a certain sense. Uh, I think in Japan, and this was great back in you know, the heydays where, you know, it was good, essential to keep the people you know, together when uh, things were going, economy, the economy was driving, so keep loyalty. That situation has a considerable change, right? And so uh, some of the companies which are, which are uh, having trouble is, is trying to unlearn what they've learned. And as you know, in Japan, you have a tradition of rotation every three years or so, right? And so you have a lot of specialists of the company, but as well as you don't have new blood. And it's great because when you want to do something new, they they send employees to learn these things. And I think in the past you could do that, but now you have to buy the expertise, which means that uh, you got to buy companies or you got to recruit people. As you know, labor mobility is still, still not very high. I mean, in, in Geishkes, like in the farm caps, that's high. But actually, when you look at the pool of people, it's becoming, it's very small. Although, with the labor shortage, is becoming different. However, there's still a, a, an issue where you need to pay for that performance. And that hasn't really caught up yet. I think so. That need, there, you need to find the pr- proper balance uh, and and um, and change the, the mentality, because uh, if you're there to protect the company, you need new ideas. And if you have nobody else from, uh, no new ideas coming in, and as you know in Japan, when you when you, new grads come in, they go through a very rigorous training. But it's also a bit of um, brainwashing to uh, to to fit the culture of the company. So. Well, who, someone may, who may have in being innovative, are have lost the um, the I guess the the intuition to be innovative and to follow the company path more than become innovative. So that's the, that's that's the fundamental problem. How do you break that? Mm, yeah. Well, um, this may sound strange, but I basically told people is you need to understand what your value in the company is, and 
and by knowing that, it'll, it'll make your job easier rather than just uh, you know, asking for your boss for instructions. Because if you know what your value is and what, where your value is adding to the whole chain of the, of the company, then you should be able to know what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And so, but I also said that by adding value to yourselves, you're making yourself more valuable. Mm-hmm. And value being to the external market. And so, and this may be a little bit daring, but I told them, if we can't keep you interested by inc- once you increase your value to us, and if he can't keep you interested in keeping you aboard, then we have a problem on the management side. Mm-hmm. I, I told them that several times, and some people picked up and some people didn't, but I think, uh, you know, when we get people from traditional Japanese company, a lot of people struggle because they listen to their boss. But... Then they come in and they struggle as well because, you know, in Japan, you struggle with a bad boss, but you can hang in there for three years and then your boss will probably change. In Japan, it's not the case. In, in foreign caps, it's not the case. So we would bring in new people and they struggle at the first because they, they do what their boss tells them rather than to develop a network a matrix, right? And this is where I think the what big difference is foreign cap companies that work in a matrix, mm-hmm. Japan still works in a top-down methodology. Mm-hmm. So I think um, teaching people to to make their own decisions without being fully instructed to the last T is something which is capable. That means taking risk mm-hmm. and uh, taking inputs from two different people who are not necessarily fighting but have a different uh, view, let's say sales and marketing, mm-hmm and make your best decision as to which is the best decision for the company. So in terms of uh, numbers, how, how many people were at Infineon? Uh, when I took it over, so I, and I can't go into de- de- details, but it was about 100, and I think now it's over 200. Pretty so reasonably sized company. And I'm not asking for numbers on, on revenues, but you just... No, you, I can, you, I can tell you. Okay, all right. Well, how much how much how much dough was Infineon turning over? Uh, we when, when we started it was about 150, and now I think I would say it's now beyond, beyond a billion dollars. Oh wow! In yeah, Japan. yeah. And then you know, there's been a lot of uh, natural growth, but I, as well as I would say, put so this you've way, you've taken from 150 million to over a billion dollars in the 17 years you were there. Well, well uh, less than a billion, but now it's okay. probably a billion. Well, yeah. we, we call that a giving in golf, so we'll we'll give you the billion there. Yeah. But that's phenomenal for growth, isn't it? No, no, no. And I think that, that one good thing is Japan, obviously, of course, uh, the team here in Japan helped a lot. But I would say that uh, Infineon was a great company in the sense that they, they once they recognized the strength of the region, they actually used that mm-hmm. and 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 uh, are open to, to learning from their mistakes or open to learn from the customers in the regions. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing is... You know, if you have that in corporate headquarters, and, and of course, you need to educate or, yes, educate, I would say, the, the corporate headquarters as to how things work, uh, Then, and if that works, then you get uh, a more leeway in operating the way you think you need to do in, in, in Japan. And that's often a, a struggle, isn't it, for execs here who are reporting back to headquarters in another country with a completely different culture, different business culture, and trying to explain Japan to headquarters is always a bit difficult. How did you go about explaining Japan to headquarters? Well, I, I think uh, that's my fortune. I had 17 years to uh, make a lot of mistakes and explain them and apologize several times. So, <laughs> But you need to have a constant thing. So, I mean, one of the, I think one of the big mistakes would be to send an executive over for three years and, you know, because the executives are expats are expensive, you can they can usually only have you know they have term limits of three or four years. It's very difficult to to understand and and turn around. Uh, and you know you bring a family over, your family and yourself getting used to it, and then uh, and then you know towards the end you need to see, <laughs> start looking for a job when you get back home. So in effect, you're only useful for a year or two. And, and so that's the challenge some of the expat people face. And it's not everybody the same thing, but I think that's one of the challenges when you ha- when you send a let's say a novice uh, to to Japan. I would say. And yeah, I've asked you a number of things. There's something I've missed. You think I could ask you about leadership in Japan that we haven't touched on? I, th- I think uh, you know a lot of people talk about um, uh, the lack of leadership in Japan. 
uh, and uh, I agree that to that to that Western uh, uh, from a Western perspective that is true. But I think um, there are certain good elements of 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 Japanese culture, which means that there's been a a lot, very little um, corporate greed, right? Maybe there should be more, but you know, when you you have these um, uh, uh, miss missed issues or, or mi mi financial misdeeds, there's usually nobody pocketing a huge bunch of money and and running away, right? And which is unlike some other countries. So I think um, honesty is is um, is 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 a, a key um, strength in Japan. How do you how do you convert that to more in, innovatism and more entrepreneurialism? I don't know, right? Uh, but I think uh, there's a good foundation to build business, which is trust and honesty. How do you equate that to taking more risk? I guess you know, everybody has their own way, and that's that's probably the uh, the rough part, the, the, the most difficult part to to, to find the solution. Hmm. Anything else we could have talked about? I don't know. I mean, this is a good place to be. I mean, everything works. Food's great. And uh, what can I say? Well, it's got rule of law. You know, things work, as you say. And generally speaking, uh, there is a place for geishke companies and, and people, you know, who are coming from those countries to staff them to make a difference here. So there is an opportunity to make a career in Japan, certainly. You've certainly made a great career in Japan. Yeah, I still hope to uh, make some more, bring some more to Japan, and I think... Yeah. Uh, what are you doing these days? You've retired from Infineon, yes. but you're still... You're not playing golf or playing, you know, uh, going to Hawaii or something. You're actually still, still beavering away. Beavering away. So, so um, i looking at uh, the digital... Everybody say AI. <laughs> uh, uh, and big data, and uh, I mean, it was all, I was always interested in it because it was, we we're certain kind of involved in that where um, automotive driving, auto autonomous driving in the automotive world, where Infineon is, is, is a serious play in that with, with radar technologies and lighter technologies. But more and more, is uh, in the car is going to be driven by software and not, you know, artificial intelligence as well as uh, big data crunching. And uh, so I've uh, helping you know, uh, uh, companies uh, analyze factory data, which is usually a little bit messy because they're all old equipment, new equipment, equipment from different manufacturers. There are no standards. But what's what's what I clearly is that big data and good data analytics can actually relieve so much of the problems of quality and efficiency uh, that it's incredible. It's an incredible, powerful tool to have. Here we have a challenge uh, because of the Japanese organization decision-making thing. Because AI is so complex, um, there's very little understanding on, on, on in the, in the, in the manage, traditional management-style companies. And and, and yet, this is not just a technology thing. It is a organizational change thing. Because if you start using AI, it's not going to get rid of jobs, but it's going to enhance different jobs in different ways. That it's going to change the organization structure. And this is where Japan is very, very weak at in terms of, of I think, uh, making deliberate organizational change to suit the technology versus... The you know, organizations which are there to serve. So, what what where would you identify the weakness? What's the weakness? Well, what 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 has been Japan's strength, at least in manufacture, could become weaknesses. You know, uh, for example, you know, Industry 4.0 uh, was a weapon, I think, for Germany to modernize the industry. And what I think well, the clear key thing was they basically digitized uh, manufacturing and. Why digital manufacturing is key is knowledge transfer becomes more easy, right? And and knowledge transfer takes years if you do it the human way. You have the the meister who's there who then has to teach it over and takes decades to do that. But if you can digitize it, then of course the meister no longer gets to to develop the kid, but the kid or the the new younger person gets to use it that know-how stored in a different technology in different ways and probably more powerful ways. In Japan, you have the Gemba, uh, which is one of the best. And I think, I think Industry 4.0 in a certain way says that was for Germany to overtake Japan because 
you know, Japanese Gemba and the German Gemba both competing edge. So Gemba means the, the, the factory edge. floor, the factory, the factory floor, floor, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but right now the Gemba is so strong that there is a little bit of a reluctance to go digital. But what's becoming clearer that is these people are getting older and they're less and less workers, the, the digitization needs to happen. So I think they're, they're trying to digitize quicker, but you know they've taken a long delay. But they need to make fast decisions, and fast decisions are not the strength of traditional corporate Japanese mechanism. Mm -hmm. And here you see a lot of other worlds where the CEO actually takes a more active Role when they, you know, he takes his shirt sleeves up and goes on the factory floor. You never see that happening in Japan. Mm -hmm. It's more of a, you know, more of a, 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 a uh, uh, was a kind of a uh, um, ceremonial role when they do that. But you know, you see more and more um, senior managers really go into the factory floor and talk with the operators and kind of figure out and say that digital change is necessary and then I'm here to drive that change. I think that, that kind of um, uh, change management is probably going to be more necessary in, in Japan in the future. Mm. Well, Yasuaki Morisan, that has been fascinating conversation about leadership and also the extra bonus there of talking about AI and Japan's future with AI. Thank you very much for joining me today on the Leadership Japan Series podcast. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining the Leadership Japan series. If you found the program useful, then tell your family, friends, and colleagues. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. If you'd like to join a free live workshop we can deal with any questions you have, then just put an email header, I am based in, wherever you live, and I'm interested in joining your live leadership session. And send it to greg.story at dalecunning.com. Planning to do a Zoom meeting with everyone? We will record it for those who can't make it. Tell me your location because I may do a couple of versions to best suit your time zone. We are planning this for September 28th, so shoot me your information so we can organise everything in time. Maybe you can contact me at greg.story at dalecunning.com. Lots of great stuff on our website over there at enjapan.dalecunning.com. Watch our videos at Japan Dale Cunning TV on YouTube. Start reading Japan Sales Mastery. Also, Japan Business Mastery. And listen to my other podcasts, the Presentations Japan Series, Sales Japan Series, and the Cutting Edge Japan Business Show, now available on the podcast. And you will find all of those podcasts wherever you normally get your podcasts. Watch my TV show, The Cutting Edge Japan Business Show on YouTube comes out every Tuesday. Until the next episode, take what you thought valuable, put it into action because idea application is what makes winners winners. So be one of them. Remember, I'm your corporate coaching and training guy here in Japan to help you grow your business. <laughs>